We began a new series last week on Paul's letter to the Colossians. Let me read just the first two verses this morning. I began this new series last week in Paul's letter to the Colossians that I entitled Jesus plus nothing equals everything. That really is the overarching message of this particular letter, that Jesus plus nothing equals everything. That is what Paul intended to communicate as he penned this letter to the churches in Colossae. And I introduced the series last week by providing a broad overview of the book as a whole. And I looked at the structure of Colossians, the stature of Colossians, and the contemporary significance of Colossians. And I mentioned that any time you get ready to dig in deep to a book study in the Bible, it's important, I think, to gain a bird's eye perspective on the book as a whole before you get into the details so that you can make sense of the details as you make your way through the book. But this week, I want us to dig in specifically by looking at verses 1 and 2. So as I read Colossians chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, give careful attention to the reading of God's Word. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. And may God add his rich blessing to this reading of his holy and inspired word. Paul introduces his letter, not surprisingly, by saying that he comes not by his own authority, with his own opinions. Rather, he comes as a spokesman for Christ, by the will and authority of God. Now, that may seem, at first glance, when you read verse 1, like that's a throwaway verse, that we need to just simply get past that verse and get into the meat of the letter. But that verse packs a powerful punch because Paul wants us to know that everything he's about to say does not originate in him. It comes from God. It's not simply his opinions. But everything he's about to say comes from God. He speaks as a spokesman for Christ. He makes that very clear. An apostle of Christ Jesus, an ambassador, a spokesman for Christ, by the will of God. I come not by my own will. I do not come with man-made opinions. I come as a result of being called and set apart by God to speak to God's people God's truth. I like what one writer, the way he put this, Sam Storms put it this way, Paul's ministry as an apostle did not come by human nomination, nor did he look for human confirmation. Rather, it was by divine initiation, preparation, and authentication. He came from God to speak God's truth to God's people. Well, having stated that he's an apostle sent from God with divine authority, Paul lays out the gospel in verse 2. Now, interestingly, in all of Paul's letters, he gives the bottom line of the gospel right at the beginning. He always begins with the words grace and peace. Now, there again, we may be tempted to simply read past that and simply conclude that 
This is just an opening salutation. And we believe that there's really nothing significant happening here when Paul opens his letters this way, other than just a formal greeting. But if you've studied Paul at any length, if you've read his letters and you understand the man, then you know that Paul was a gospel-intoxicated man who chose his words very carefully and very intentionally. He didn't waste his words. He intended to communicate something very clearly. Even here, when at first glance it may simply look like nothing more than an opening salutation, Paul wanted the church to gain a better understanding of the gospel. He wanted Christians to comprehend more fully Christ's incredible work on their behalf and then to live in a more vital awareness of that good news day in and day out. So right here at the beginning, he launches into the gospel. And in a moment, I'm going to unpack those two words, grace and peace, and show how those two words demonstrate the essence of the gospel. That everything Paul says after verse 2 is an articulation of and a defense of the gospel as summarized in the two words, grace and peace. So here again, right at the beginning of this letter, Paul wants to make it clear, as I mentioned last week, Paul wants to make it clear that the gospel is not just for Christians. It's bigger than that. It's for Christians too. We're going to look at that next week when we look at verses 5 and 6. Paul in those verses says, Of this you have heard before in the word of the truth, the gospel which has come to you, as indeed in the whole world it is bearing fruit and growing, as it also does among you, since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth. And what Paul is saying there is that the gospel is not only growing wider in the world, but the gospel is growing deeper in the lives of Christians. Paul wants to correct a truncated view of the gospel, which simply concludes that the gospel is for non-Christians. What Paul wants to show in and through this letter, and he launches right into it here in verse 2, is that the gospel is bigger than that. It's more sizable than that. That the gospel is not just for non-Christians, it's for Christians too. For Paul, these two words, grace and peace, really summed up the essence of the gospel. And I want to look at two things this morning briefly as we break down these two words. I want to look at grace as being the root of the gospel and peace as being the fruit of the gospel. These two remarkable words really do give us the bottom line, the essence of the gospel. For those of you who may, like me, struggle with patience, Paul gets right to the point right at the beginning. We don't have to wait till the middle of the first chapter or the beginning of the third chapter or the end of the fourth chapter to really see the heart of what Paul is wanting to get at here in his letter. He launches right into the essence of the gospel right here at the beginning. So, two things. Grace as the root of the gospel and peace as the fruit of the gospel. First, grace as the root of the gospel. The foundational notion behind every worldview except Christianity is humanity's ascent. Okay? Whether it's another world religion or just some secular worldview, 
every belief system other than Christianity is bottom up in nature. And what I mean by that is this. They all require you to work your way up toward acceptance, to work your way up toward meaning, to work your way up toward approval, and so on. If you do any study whatsoever of any other world religion or any other secular worldview, whatever it might be, the one common thread that runs through all of them is simply this, that salvation, freedom, and deliverance can only be attained by trying harder, by performing well. Your identity depends on what you can do, who you can become. Everything rides on your individual effort. Every secular belief system, whether it's materialism, consumerism, whatever the case may be, all of them are promising you one thing, freedom, deliverance, rescue, salvation, meaning, purpose, or whatever other word you may want to use. All of them offer that, whether it be a world religion like Buddhism, Islam, or whether it be some secular worldview like materialism or consumerism or whatever. Every single one of them, in essence, requires you to work your way up. That your identity depends on what you can do, who you can become. Everything is riding on your individual effort. Now, in contrast to that, the foundational notion behind Christianity is not our ascent, but God's descent. Christianity is remarkably unique in that regard. That Christianity is not a bottom-up religion, but a top-down relationship. God descended to us in the person of Jesus Christ because we could never ascend to him. That in the person of Jesus, God achieved for us what we could never achieve for ourselves. That in his life, by his death, and with his resurrection, Jesus secured the righteousness, the rescue, the freedom, the meaning, and the purpose that we spend a lifetime trying to secure for ourselves. The Bible tells us that in Jesus, God came into our world physically. It's not a fairy tale. It happened that God, according to John 1, took on human flesh. That Jesus is the only begotten Son of the Father. That God came into our world physically to rescue sinners from the penalty, from the power, and eventually the presence of sin. And as you've heard me say on numerous occasions, Christ came not to angrily strip away our freedom, but to affectionately strip away our slavery to self and to sin so that we might become genuinely free. Paul, especially when you read through Galatians, as we get ready to start community groups, the end of this month, which I really hope and pray that all of you who call this your church home become a part of. As our church gets bigger, it must at the same time get smaller in the sense that we need to be more intimately connected to one another because God did not intend for us to walk the wilderness of this life alone. While he saved us as individuals, he saves us to community. And community groups, smaller groups of, you know, 10 to 20 people are our way to stay connected and to invest in one another's life. But we're going to be going through the book of Galatians in our community groups. And what you're going to discover as we make our way through Galatians is that Paul is absolutely addicted to the biblical notion of freedom. 
that he demonstrates through not only Galatians, but through many of his letters, obviously, that Christ came to set us free. That Christ did not come to enslave us, but to set us free. That Jesus came to set the captives free. Therefore, grace stands at the very center of all that Christians believe about God and the freedom he provides for sinners. Grace is, as I learned growing up with the acrostic G-R-A-C-E, God's riches at Christ's expense. That because of what Christ came to do, because of what Jesus came to accomplish with his life, death, and resurrection, those who place our faith and trust in him and not ourselves receive all of God's riches, freedom, rescue, righteousness, deliverance. Or my favorite definition of grace is this. Grace is unconditional acceptance granted to an undeserving person by an unobligated giver. Let me say that again. Grace is unconditional acceptance granted to an undeserving person by an unobligated giver. Every part of that definition is super important if we're going to understand the nature of grace. Because of what Jesus accomplished, undeserving sinners, like you and me, are granted unconditional acceptance by an unobligated giver. If we conclude that God is obligated to help those who help themselves, then grace ceases to be grace, if that's our understanding of grace. Or if we lose sight of the fact that we are undeserving people. Many of us sadly conclude that we're pretty good. We obey the rules. We stay within the boundaries. And because of our good behavior, we are not only deserving of God's favor, but God is obligated to bless us. Like I said last week, grace distinguishes the gospel from moralism. Remember, I mentioned if you were here last week, morality is a good thing. And Paul's going to have a lot to say about morality as we make our way through the letter. Moralism, on the other hand, is a bad thing. It takes something good and it turns it into something ultimate. Moralism says, if I improve myself, then I will be accepted by others, by society, by God, whatever. My ability to improve is the basis by which God, others, society is then obligated to accept me and to approve of me. That's moralism. The gospel says, because of what God has already done for me in Christ, I'm accepted. Therefore, I will inevitably improve because I'm a new creation. Now understand the very subtle distinction there. Moralism places your performance before God's acceptance. The gospel places your acceptance in Christ before your performance. Now, Paul's emphasis on grace in all of his letters, and we're going to see specifically here, Paul's emphasis on grace is to show first what God has done for us. He never ever begins, I mentioned this last week, Paul in all of his letters never ever begins by telling us what we should do, ever. He never begins with the horizontal imperative. He always begins with the vertical indicative, what God has already done for you. Always. He begins never by telling us what we should do, 
He begins by telling us what Christ has already done. And this is very, very important for us to understand because all too often our relationship with God drifts into performance mode. Let me read some lines from Jerry Bridges from his remarkable book, Transforming Grace, which I highly recommend you write that down right now, Jerry Bridges, Transforming Grace, and then buy it and read it, every word. Listen to what he says. Incidentally, my introduction to Jerry Bridges happened at Westminster Academy when we were required to read his book, The Pursuit of Holiness, which I did not appreciate until many years later. In his book, Transforming Grace, Bridges writes, my observation, now this is going to sting, but that's good because God is changing all of us. My observation of modern Christianity is that most of us tend to base our relationship with God on our performance instead of on his grace. If we've performed well, whatever well is in our opinion, then we expect God to bless us. If we haven't done so well, then our expectations are reduced accordingly. In this sense, we live by works rather than by grace. We are saved by grace, we acknowledge that, but we are living by the sweat of our own performance. We give lip service to the grace of God, but our unspoken motto is, God helps those who help themselves. The realization that my daily relationship with God is based on the infinite merit of Christ instead of my own performance is a very freeing and joyous experience. Now listen, you've heard me say this before. The difference between living for God and living for anything else is that when we live for anything else, we do so to gain approval. But when we live for God, we do so because in Christ we are already approved. And you know what that means? That means this, that real freedom, genuine freedom, the only, the freedom that only God's grace can grant is living for something because we already have favor instead of living for something in order to gain favor. That's slavery. Freedom is living for something because we already have favor. And that is only offered in Christianity, in the gospel. I have a friend named Kevin who wrote this recently, and it really, really gripped my heart and corrected me as a preacher. Kevin, who is also a pastor... And a preacher wrote, no doubt some Christians need to be shaken out of their lethargy. But there are also a whole bunch of Christians who need to be set free from their performance-minded shackles. I promise you, he writes, some of the best people in your churches are getting tired. They don't need to hear more statistics and stories about how bad everything is in the world. They need to hear about Christ's death and resurrection. They need to hear how we are justified by faith apart from the works of the law. They need to hear the old, old story once more. And this is, he concludes with this sentence, which is profound. Because the secret of the gospel is that we actually do more when we hear less about all we need to do for God and hear more about all that God has already done for us. That's grace. And Paul launches into a profound biblical definition of grace throughout this letter. But he wants us right at the outset in verse 2 to get that word in our brains. He wants to show us right at the outset That grace is central to everything he's about to say. Well, if grace is the root of the gospel, then peace is the fruit of the gospel. As I mentioned last week, the the city of Colossae was a marketing center where various human philosophies and traditions and opinions were vying for supremacy. Supremacy. 
much like the city of Fort Lauderdale, much like every major city in the world today. There is not one dominating worldview in any large city in our postmodern world. And at the heart, as I mentioned earlier, at the heart of every competing worldview is the offer of freedom, of deliverance. Every man-made philosophy, tradition, religion, and way of life offers freedom as the supreme prize. Do this, do that, achieve this, and achieve that, and you will be free. Make enough money, earn the right reputation, Get enough stuff, meet the right people, find yourself in the center of the most important group in society, attain enough power, financial, political, or otherwise, and you will finally have the freedom that you crave. Whatever it is, every worldview offers freedom as the biggest prize. Well, realizing this, Paul repeatedly reminds the Colossians of the freedom and deliverance they already have in Christ. For instance, chapter 1, verse 13. Paul writes, he has, past tense, already delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption and the forgiveness of sins. In other words, because of what Christ has done, you already have, Christian, you already possess the freedom that all of these other worldviews are selling you. Don't buy it. Why buy something you already possess? It makes no sense. In other words... There is nothing and no one in this world that can offer the freedom and the deliverance that Jesus can. And throughout this letter, Paul is very concerned that Christians not live beneath the level of their privileges. He's going to put on grand display the privileges that Christians already possess in Christ. And then he exhorts us not to live beneath the level of our privileges, that everything we need in Christ we already have, that Jesus plus nothing equals everything, that everything minus Jesus equals nothing. Now that whole idea, what I just explained, is at the heart of the word peace. The word that Paul uses for peace, shalom, means more than merely the absence of conflict. It means fullness and wholeness and completeness. It carries with it a sense of things being settled. The peace that Paul has in view is peace that only God's rescuing grace brings. Harmony, serenity, tranquility. Paul wants us to know that nothing and no one in this world can provide this deep, abiding sense of okayness except the peace of God. Therefore, we can say that grace is the root of the gospel and peace is the fruit of the gospel. Isaiah 32, 17 says, the fruit of righteousness will be peace and the effect of righteousness will be quietness and confidence forever. This quietness and confidence forever is what Paul means when he speaks of the peace of God or what my grandmother referred to as a quiet knowing. That deep, abiding sense of wholeness, completeness, okayness. That regardless of what is happening in your world, in your life, Regardless of what sort of tragedy you may be facing, health or otherwise, there is a peace of God which transcends all understanding that is the fruit of what Christ came to accomplish for sinners like you and me. By his stripes we are healed. He came to accomplish what Athanasius called the glorious exchange the great exchange 
And the fruit of that exchange of Christ coming to do for us what we could never do for ourselves is this deep, abiding sense of peace regardless of what we face. When God has made peace with us, when things between God and us have been settled because of Christ's work, we experience the peace of God which transcends all understanding. We experience an assurance and a settledness about life that we didn't have before. When God saved me at 21 years old, my life radically changed. And I can remember sitting at my mom and dad's dinner table and my dad asking me, Tullian, what is the biggest difference in your life since God has saved you? And my immediate response was, amazingly, Dad, I, I don't worry about things as much. I, I'm, not, I'm not a worrier like I used to be. Because before I understood God's grace in Christ, everything depended on me my relationships, my well-being, what I was able to accomplish. It was all on me. And I worried that I wasn't going to be able to do everything that I needed to do for myself. And yet when God saved me, that peace of God which transcended all understanding took root deep in the fabric of my being. Before any other gospel fruit manifested itself in my life, there was peace, peace of God. And many of you can testify to the same thing. It is God's peace that gave a young warrior like me that inner tranquility of mind, which is the fruit of the gospel. The rock-solid belief that Christ plus nothing equals everything, that if I am in Christ, then everything I need, I already have. It is God's peace alone which can cause you to say with Paul in Philippians 4, I've learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. That's peace. Let me just conclude with this. When you understand that if you have God's grace and peace in Christ, you have nothing to lose, when you really get that, It enables you to live a life of great freedom and fearlessness and unbounded courage because you realize that the one thing you need, nothing and no one in this world can take away from you, namely Christ. You realize that in Christ, your identity and your significance is secure forever, which frees you to give everything you have because in Christ, you have everything you need. Now, my middle son, Nathan, my oldest son, Gabe, turns 15 today. I cannot believe it. So all of you friends who have survived the teenage years, I will be coming to you for counsel very shortly. But my middle son, Nathan, who's getting ready to turn 13 in a couple of months, had to memorize what I'm about to read you in conclusion for school in second grade. Maybe you've heard it before. I had never heard it before. And it describes the the kind of freedom and security that God's grace and peace grants. Listen to this. It's entitled, The Fellowship of the Unashamed. I am a part of the fellowship of the unashamed. The die has been cast. The decision has been made. I am a disciple of Jesus. Therefore, I won't look back, let up, slow down, back away, or be still. My past is redeemed, my present is empowered, and my future is secure. I'm done with low living, sight walking, small planning, smooth knees, colorless dreams, tamed visions, mundane talking, cheap giving, and dwarfed goals. I no longer need preeminence, prosperity, position, promotions, praise, or popularity. I don't have to win, be first, be right, recognized, regarded, or rewarded. I now live by faith, lean on his presence, love with patience, live by prayer, and labor with power. My goal is God's glory. My face is set. My pace is fast. My road is narrow. My way is rough. My companions are few. My guide is reliable, and my mission is clear. I cannot be bought, 
compromised, detoured, lured away, turned back, deluded, or delayed. I will not flinch in the face of sacrifice, hesitate in the presence of adversity, negotiate at the table of the enemy, ponder at the pool of popularity, or meander in the maze of mediocrity. I won't give up, shut up, let up, or slow up until I have stayed up, stored up, prayed up, paid up and spoken up for the cause of Christ. I must go till he comes, give till I drop, preach till all know, and work till he stops me. Christ has qualified me to become a part of the fellowship of the unashamed. I am his and he is mine. Now, unattainable apart from the amazing grace and peace of God. Do you know it? Because I've just preached on it, now you know something about those two words. But do you know God's amazing grace? Do you know God's peace which transcends all understanding? 